I was cutting firewood in a designated timber cut area with my brother, approximately halfway between Cody and Yellowstone. We were south of the highway, very near the north bank of the North Fork, an easterly flowing tributary of Buffalo Bill Reservoir. The timber in this area is not dense and affords good views of the high north-facing mountain slopes south of the river. Shortly before sundown, I noticed movement up on the slope across the river. At first, I concluded that it must be a bear or elk and pointed it out to my brother. My brother fetched the binoculars from the pickup just to have a closer look, as we are hunters and like to keep track of where we see elk. At first, he seemed startled in that he didn't recognize what he was looking at. Rather than a jump to a conclusion, he handed me the glasses and asked me to have a look. By the time I got the glasses up, the animal had disappeared into the tree line and I couldn't see it. Shortly after, I noticed it again lower down on the slope in a small clearing, moving all the while. At this point, I would estimate the creature at a quarter mile from us, moving closer, down slope towards the river. This time, I got a good look at it through the glasses. It was definitely unmistakably upright, walking on two legs. Though there is no way to say at this distance, the specimen appeared to be between six and ten feet in height. More striking, however, was its mass. The creature, covered in dark hair, almost seemed fat, maybe obese. This was no bear. I saw it walk for a good 100 yards, and it never came down on all fours. There is something on the North Fork that I have sure never seen before. About a half an hour after my last sighting, we were loading the truck. The chainsaw wasn't running, so we could hear reasonably well. The river makes some noise. Right before we left, almost completely dark, I heard a high-pitched, eerie squealing noise coming from a few hundred yards of river. I have never heard anything like it, though it is about the right time of year to still hear elk bugle. This was no elk, ladies and gentlemen. The sighting was witnessed by my friend and myself, both of whom are geologists, while driving into Yellowstone from Cody for employment at the park for the summer. My friend was taking his turn at driving, and I was soaking up as much as I could and see, as well as providing a running commentary to keep my friend alert driving our long drive. As we came around a curve in the road, our high beams illuminated a large, dark, shaggy figure coming up out of the ditch on the left side, south of the road, at a distance of about 250 feet. As we approached the figure, at a speed of about 45 miles an hour, it looked first at the vehicle. We noticed the yellow reflection from its eyes that is seen in a dog's eyes when light catches it at night. Then it deliberately turned its head away from the lights. That motion was non-human or bear-like in that the shoulders, chest, and head moved simultaneously as it caught sight of our vehicle and then turned its face away from the headlights. We slowed. Well, actually, we slammed on the brakes, stunned at what we were seeing and trying to rationalize what we were looking at. Some sort of hominid creature, perhaps seven and a half feet tall in height, we have a seven-foot-tall friend as a reference, massing perhaps 600 to 800 pounds without obvious signs of obesity, standing completely and comfortably upright, came up out of the ditch from the left side of the road right at the edge of the metal barrier above the culvert. It took three extraordinarily long and fluid strides across the highway, 22 feet in total, and another three of four shorter strides down the other side of the road, actually appearing to catch hold of the metal barrier and railing with one long fingered hairy hand, with finally swinging down under the road into the box culvert or channel bottom, completely out of our line of sight. We stopped the vehicle within 25 feet of the culvert 
and watched the final descent of the creature into the darkness of the channel. And at this point, we sped on toward the east gate of Yellowstone National Park, hoping to find a ranger to report the sighting to, and perhaps to go back and take another look. There was nobody at the gate, due to the late hour, and we didn't see any lights on anywhere. So we just continued on to our destination, and went to bed, deciding not to contaminate each other's observations with discussions until morning. In the morning, we both independently described graphically and in writing as much of what we had seen six hours before. This is a synopsis of our finding. There were virtually identical down to the movement of which leg moved first as the creature crossed the road. The head appeared to merge into the neck, and there was no snout or protrusion from the face as would be commonly seen in a bear. Trust me, I've seen hundreds, up close and in person. The face was not clearly visible and was only glimpsed for a moment. We both got an impression of long hair covering some of it. The nostrils were large and open, but neither of us were able to describe mouth or teeth. The eyes weren't exceptional, just the reflection of gold, just like a dog's. What each of us can still describe with great clarity is the size, shape, and unique fluid movement of the creature. It was large, easily seven to seven and a half feet-ish, but not much bigger than that. It was very heavy and powerful looking. In shape, it possessed a rather blocky, yet elongated head, slightly domed on the top of the cranium, thick, short neck, broad shoulders, and a full chest. It was square and longer through the torso and hips than a human. And as it walked across the road in front of us, the buttocks were clearly seen as muscular masses moving under heavy, shaggy fur. They obviously attached to long, powerful muscular thighs, longer in proportion to a human. Big knees that functioned as a human knee. Thick, muscular calves and feet in proportion to the rest of the oversized body. The soles of the feet appeared to be hairless, or less covered in hair and very dark in color. The arms hung from heavily muscled shoulders and were longer than a human reaching to the knee length and extending fully and almost a horizontal position to the front and rear of the body as it moved. The elbows were perhaps a little further down the arm than on a human, or the usual length of the arm made it appear so. The hands were large and long fingered. Neither of us could really describe the palms, nails, or other than the backs of the hands which were covered in the same long, shaggy, dark brown hair as the rest of the creature. The creature made no sound nor gesture throughout the sighting. It appeared a little startled at our vehicle appearing out of the night, but in no other way frightened or threatened. It certainly startled both of us though, that's for sure. April 20th, 2003. A friend and I were carrying in supplies on foot to a bear bait site, about two miles west of Highway 89 in Wyoming. This area is restricted to foot or horseback only and is on the Idaho-Wyoming border. I had carried in the bait barrel and some bait items a week earlier, having noted some bear tracks in the snow along the creek on the first week of April. We walked along the foot trail early morning and about a mile in, came upon the fresh carcass of a muskrat right on the trail, which was about 30 feet up from the creek and along the bend of the mountain. We were both startled by the dead muskrat because there was just no evidence of a predator in sight. I suggested that it may have been dropped by an eagle, but honestly, there had been no sightings of eagles on our walk either. Another mile in, and we began placing our bait in the barrel having noted that the bait was already there that had not been disturbed by anything. We were preparing to leave the site when we heard the cracking of branches and looking in the direction of the noise, we watched a large piece of tree tumbling down the mountainside towards us. About 400 yards up on the ledge stood something bipedal, the color of a moose leaning against the remains of a tree. 
I nudged and asked my friend, What is that? He replied, Must be a moose. And I answered, But it only has two feet. He did not reply, but started walking back to the trail. I looked back at the animal, which was at least eight feet tall as best as I could estimate. Very broad at the shoulders, with legs that appeared long and thin compared to the rest of its body. It was hard to make out the shape of its head, as I couldn't see a neck, and its head appeared to be bent, looking down the mountain towards us. It then quickly moved behind the broken tree and into the tree line. I wish I had brought my binoculars that day, but in our haste to get on the trail that morning, I accidentally left them in the truck. My feeling while returning along the trail to the truck was almost myself being stalked, a strange role reversal. My friend moved quickly down the trail. No words spoken about what was on that hillside. When I recounted the experience a couple months later to friends, I had forgotten all about the part about the dead muskrat, which my friend quickly interjected to them as a very disturbing incident to him. Yet he laughed when I told them we may have seen a Bigfoot, which he readily dismissed. This bear bait site coincidentally, is along a drainage that connects to a larger creek near where a year ago, I had heard some strange and disturbing sounds on a mountain pass while hunting deer. Leaving the east gate of Yellowstone near sundown, somewhere between there and Cody, maybe halfway, and after dark, I saw a dark, bipedal motion moving out of the tunnel of light provided by my van. It was very brief, and when I got back to Florida at some point, I received a field and stream and read about the Skookum cast. After reading it, I went to the BFRO and found the Wyoming hot spot, and it all came back. I'm a cautious observer and realized how your eyes can sometimes play tricks. I asked my wife prior to telling her about the Skookum cast article or the other information, about whether she remembered me saying anything on the way when she left Yellowstone. She said that all she could remember was me joking about seeing Bigfoot. I wanted to be sure it wasn't a manufactured memory, because some time had passed. It was a long day, and we had seen lots of wildlife, and finished with a nursing grizzly with two cubs, just before leaving the park. What I saw reminded me of a moose in color. I've always described moose as being difficult to see at night by saying it's the black that moves at the outer limits of your lights. Often, you really don't get a clear outline of the animal, but know by the way it moves. I don't know if that makes sense, but it's 2.30 in the morning now, so forgive me, I'm a bit groggy. I was planning a trip back this summer to take a better look around. I was finishing at Masters last summer at Colorado State and had a week between classes, so we headed to Yellowstone in hopes of seeing a grizzly and the park. Had I been in Washington, I probably would have been looking for the Gigantopithecus. Many years ago, I talked to Dr. Krantz and Peter Byrne while working on a project for an animal behavior class at the University of Florida. When I called them, they seemed credible and were very helpful. My memory is from a second or two. Two strides that it took from the middle of the eastbound lane to the middle of the westbound lane to the gravel on the side of the road, dark and large. Half laughing, I told my wife that I saw a Sasquatch. She said, so did she. We both laughed and said we must be tired. She said turn around, which made me laugh even more. We're just tired. She pointed out that we didn't even know we'd ever get back. I don't think any more about it until I went to the BFRO, but I'll be going back this summer, probably June, depending on the cost of gas. It's getting crazy again. I am an outdoor enthusiast who was visiting the Cody, Wyoming area this summer during the second week of July, right around the 14th. While traveling the highway to Yellowstone National Park, about 40 miles west of Cody, 
I encountered heavy tourist traffic late in the day. I decided, rather than fight it, to pull off the highway for a while and go for a walk. I hiked up an unmarked path north of the highway through intermittent timber. I was traveling at a leisurely pace, exploring rocky outcrops and looking for Native American artifacts. Well, about a half mile from the road, I could still hear traffic. I heard some rocks rolling downhill ahead and above me. It was maybe a hundred yards away. Mule deer and other game animals are plentiful in the area, and I didn't think much of it. I had bear spray with me, as this was a well-known grizzly country. Maybe another half an hour went past and I was taking a break, sitting on a rock ledge with a good view of the valley to the south. I heard underbrush breaking not far away on a steep, timber-covered slope that led down to a dry stream bed. I was able to distinguish the pattern of an animal walking through the trees. Again, I didn't think much of it. I'm used to hearing game in the woods and don't spook at stuff like that. I guess that it was probably deer feeding along the slope. A little odd considering the time of day. Its behavior was highly inconsistent with bears, which don't hang around when people show up. I began hiking again, and almost immediately heard something move through the brush just below me in the same spot. This was a little strange, I thought, like it was staying with me or something. I tried to see down the hill, but when I stopped, I couldn't hear it. It seemed to stop moving when I did, and I couldn't get a fix on its location. I began to get a somewhat uneasy feeling about things at this point. There is no good way to describe it, other than something seemed to be intentionally staying with me. I started walking again, shortly after, not having heard anything for a little while. I heard something run across the rocks not far up in front of me. It was up and out of the drainage at this point. I was getting a little apprehensive by this time and decided to start back towards the road, which was maybe a mile away. I walked pretty quickly and for most of the way, I heard nothing. But about a quarter mile or so from the highway and maybe 15 minutes since I turned back, I heard rocks and debris falling down slope again. It seemed awfully close and I instinctively whirled around, thinking that I might see something, which I did. So, I will do my best to describe it to you. But, as I only got a short glimpse, I can't be too sure of what it was. It was about 60 or 70 yards away, on a rocky slope, immediately adjacent to the same heavily timbered slope I had been hiking along. As soon as I turned and looked at it, it jumped right into the cover and completely out of sight. There is one thing I am absolutely certain of. Whatever it was, it was upright. I could clearly see two limbs of the ground that appeared more like arms than legs. They were definitely hanging down the side and not down the front as one might expect of a four-legged animal standing on two legs. This doesn't mean that it wasn't a bear, but I've never heard of a bear acting like this thing was. That is, if I'm right, and it was the same animal that I feel was following me all along. You hear about predatory bear behavior, where they follow people though, so who knows? At any rate, the animal was brown, with very long hair. I noticed that when it leapt into the woods. The hair on it kind of swayed to one side from the sudden motion. It seemed longer than bear hair though and to notice this swaying effect at this distance, I would guess that maybe the hair was a foot long or more. Also, for just that initial instant before its flight, I got a pretty good look at its face, which was long and somewhat flat. It was too far away to clearly make out individual features though, but I have seen several bears at greater distances, and it didn't strike me that that's what it was. I was not aware of the BRFO at the time, nor of the occurrences detailed in it for this area. When I mentioned this incident to a friend who had not heard of the BFRO either, we did a search on Bigfoot out of curiosity. 
I was a little astonished to see the main page indicating this region as potential Bigfoot country with many sightings. I figured I might as well say something. I think all three of the other incidents had witnesses and I didn't, so I can't point to another who can verify anything that I saw or heard. It would have been nice just to see if somebody else had seen something resembling what I think I saw. Trust me when I say, it takes a little bit of time for it to fully register in your brain. You just don't think right off, hey, there's a Bigfoot. I was probably almost at my vehicle before I even let that thought even enter my mind. I can't say for sure what I saw, but I had been hearing it through the woods throughout the entire hike. One tends to make these connections afterwards, but I really have no way of fully knowing. I will say, however, I think that it might have been, but this is based more on a feeling than anything else. I realize that breaking branches and rock slides don't exactly constitute scientific certainty. It really was like something was checking me out though, that's for sure. And again, the incident had occurred in the late afternoon. The weather was clear at the time, with great visibility, so there was no real mistaken identity. There might have been intermittent thunderstorms in the region, but there was no rain at the time. It was the winter of 1980. My older brother and I were hiking and camping in Yellowstone Park. After a five mile hike from the road up to a lake that reportedly was the only place in North America to catch Arctic grayling other than in the Arctic, we set up camp for the night. After eating the day's catch and cleaning up, we settled in for bed early as we were tired from the day's hiking and fishing. We were in our tent quietly talking and starting to get drowsy, when all of a sudden, something ran by us on two legs, something very large and heavy. We looked at each other with eyes bulging out of our heads, and I told him just to go see what it was. He replied, no flippin' way. And as we had no sidearms or weapons, we just sat there terrified for the rest of the night. At daybreak, we broke camp and left there looking for tracks, but the ground was bare and there was no sign of our midnight visitor except for our own personal experiences. I'm going to keep the park that I work at anonymous because I still currently work there, but in the past four months, since this whole COVID-19 craziness, there's been some bizarre and disturbing things happening. For example, the biggest one is we've been finding human remains being hung up randomly in the trees throughout the entirety of the whole park. I know that might sound disturbing, but I promise you, it's only a small segment of all the disturbing things that have been happening. Sometimes, we only find one of these human remains once a week or even one every couple few weeks. Other times, we find three to four a week, and it's never in the same spot. It's always spread throughout in random locations, but always left hanging by a rope in a tree. The human remains in question just happen to be skulls, perfectly preserved skulls, not too weathered, not rotted, just as if they were left there to be taken by nature. And because a form of human remains are involved, police have an ever-going investigation. And forensics, from what I know, have shown so far that every skull retrieved and recovered is from a missing person who has been gone for at least several years. It's very disturbing, I will admit that. And we're not sure who is putting these up or why. So far, we have no leads and we can't find any traces of any individuals putting these skulls up in trees. But I'll let you know if things continue to happen. I will share with you, however, that I do work in one of the largest parks in the entire country, and that I have a huge staff that I work alongside with. And unfortunately, I'm not the only one finding these skulls. Like I said, there's a lot of ground to cover because this is such a huge park, and there are many others in our team that are finding these along with other various human remains, like feet, for example, 
and sometimes hands, all in skeletal form, working in the forest service and participating in search and rescue. It's not necessarily uncommon to find human remains, especially those of missing persons, and even more so of missing persons who have been gone for a while. But this is on a whole new level of disturbing. It's definitely not likely to find missing remains of people found attached to ropes and only parts of their remains. It's almost like something or somebody is setting it up for us to find in some morbid way. I don't know if this is a group of people or one individual, but these skulls are placed up in places that normal people couldn't actually get to. For example, there's an instance of the park where we found three skulls in the past two months, where there's so much brush, normally, you have to have pretty thick gear to get back in there. And if it weren't for our heavy equipment, and to know that this area is there, you wouldn't even know to get back there. It's really hard to explain. I'm probably not making much sense. But what I'm trying to say is for just some innocent bystander to sneak back there and place a human skull. There would be no reason. He would have to be heavily equipped with the right gear to get back there. And we would all see him since we keep a pretty good eye on the park, after all. Anyways, I'll keep in touch with you and write you back if we find anything new or exciting to write about. For now, just know that disturbing things are still going on all throughout the country, and not just in our neighborhoods with COVID, but even currently in our national parks. Stay safe. So, I don't work in the forest service anymore, but I used to, for quite some time. And when I did, I had a variety of stories that I could tell you, but I'll keep those to myself for now. What I will tell you about, though, is for a short period of time, when I was working around the Lower East Coast, I would encounter bizarre lights going off in the forest in the early morning hours. See, I worked the nights, I don't necessarily want to say the night shift, but I worked early morning hours, and from where I was in my station, I had a perfect view of a specific area of the park. Now the park I worked at was quite a few miles large. I don't know the exact size, and I'm kind of afraid to give you the name of the park, because I worry that this will get traced back to me, and I don't want anything coming back on me, like lawsuits or any sort of harassment. You know. I might be being paranoid, but I'd rather be safe than sorry. Anyway, the lights that I'm talking about were not normal lights. If you're thinking I'm talking about fluttering flashlights, no. While the lights I saw did flutter and pulsate, it was similar to that of a really bright flash to a camera, but longer lasting and sometimes brighter. And again, the light would sometimes change colors and it would pulsate with no real timing or pattern to it. It did not match any light pattern or any person turning their lights on and off. It made virtually no sense. Sometimes you would have multiple lights going off in different locations, but all completely visible from my location. At one point, there were six lights going off at once, all doing different things. One pulsating, one seeming to flash, while the others just completely would die out at random intervals. This was very strange, and after this kept happening, night after night after night, it really began to creep me out. So I finally told my boss about it, and I was really shocked by how he treated me. He kind of berated me about it, told me to hush it up and keep quiet, and it was in my career's best interest to ignore it and just resume my duties and do what I was told. I figured something was up but I didn't care enough to poke and prod even more, to dig. I never did find out what those lights were, but then again, do I really want to? I don't know. Now that my mind and knowledge has been open to all the available park ranger stories and tales out there, although I'm sure some are creepypasta stories, while others probably hold genuine truth, it's interesting to note that there are many, many, many cases of strange things happening all throughout national parks, and what I experienced was just a fraction of what some other rangers go through. That in and of itself is terrifying to think about. 
I'm glad I got out of that job field when I did. Okay, so first off, I didn't believe in Bigfoot before this whole experience that I went through. But now, I know they're very real. And whether they're humans or creatures or part ape, I don't care. They terrify me, whatever they are. No matter what Bigfoot expert says that how peaceful they are, I don't buy it. I had my experience, and nobody can tell me otherwise. So... I and a few other rangers had the liberty of permanently closing down a trail and the fear of safety of hikers and travelers because, well, apparently, a very hostile group of Bigfoot were traveling through the area and began throwing rocks and logs at people who were hiking among this section of trail. In the month of this happening, we had received at least five different reports of seeing these large, hairy, humanoid beings that looked to be half-man half ape, throwing rocks, screaming, wood knocking, and making all sorts of racket. We ourselves got to see these things firsthand when we went to go check out the area. Me and my coworker, who were not believers before this, are now, when we got to see what we believed to be the big alpha male, who nearly threw an entire dead log at us. This thing charged us out of the tree line, and we also had rocks thrown at us, and all sorts of noise and screaming. There was also occasional wood knocking, and other noise like pounding and thudding, and all sorts of crazy thrashing around in the forest. And to be honest with you, just thinking back to the event and reliving it in my mind is utterly terrifying, because growing up my entire life, I was always told like everybody else, monsters don't exist, oh Bigfoot, don't believe in that, they don't exist, yada yada yada. Well, I'm here to tell you that people will lie to you and they have been. These things are very real, and we have to be very careful not to piss them off even more. From my gathering of this series of events, they are extremely territorial, and who knows what would have happened had we stayed around longer, or possibly provoked it. Since then, that portion of trail has been indefinitely closed down. I don't know if it's going to be permanent or not, but that is until my boss gets a hold of somebody to deal with that situation. This only happened in the past few months, so it's still pretty fresh. It was right before the whole quarantine happened, so maybe it was early March. It was just as spring was starting to come, so that's when we encountered it. I have worked at this job for a while now, and I've seen my fair share of stuff, but this takes it to a whole new level. And no, to ask anybody who wants to know, I haven't seen any stairs in the woods or any of that crap. I don't believe in that. But what I went through, I definitely can't deny that it's changed my outlook on my entire life and my job. Will I stay in this job field long term? Probably, because even though this happened to me, I still do love working as a ranger and I love being a part of search and rescue. But it's just sometimes I'm guessing I'm having to cope to deal with there are things out there in the woods that I might not exactly be mentally equipped to handle, and I'm talking more than just finding dead bodies or even missing children. What I've learned from this experience is there are things out there that are far worse than any of those things, things from your nightmare that you wouldn't normally believe exist. I just got back from a region known as Matawaska Valley in Renfrew County about three hours north of me. It is located on the southern edge of Algonquin Park. Several reports have come out of that park, including an encounter I had back in 2008. I had a different experience with three of my other friends in that same park, which involved rock throwing, odor, and even feces found. My family and I rented a cottage this week on a small private lake called Spectacle Lake. The cottage is surrounded by forest, and the region has a good population of moose, deer, wolf, beaver, and even bear. On Monday, July 27th, when we arrived at 1500 hours, we got unpacked and got settled in for the afternoon. At 1800 hours, we had a nice dinner, and then sat around a big bonfire at approximately 20 hours. 
at about 22, while sitting and talking around the fire, I heard something across the lake in the distance. I told everybody to be quiet, because I could hear something above the sound of our fire. I then heard these series of howls come from across the lake. The distance across the lake is about 500 meters. The area has thick forest with cliffs in the background. The howls seem to come well beyond the distance across the lake, and even beyond the cliffs behind the tree line. I would estimate the cliffs to be approximately 150 meters high. There are no cottages directly across the lake. There are three small cottages at a distance to the north of us. However, no one was at those cottages during the week. Having heard these kind of sounds before, I figured it was a Sasquatch, since I'm a stranger to that. But nobody else in my group has experienced this before. And naturally, they were all taken back and quite excited. Everybody agreed the howls did not sound like wolves, coyotes, loons, deer, moose, or any other kind of animal that we are familiar with. These howls went on intermittently for about a half an hour each, and they were about three to four howls each time. About midnight, the fire was dying down, and we all headed into the cottage for the night. But just before going in, we heard a large branch break close by. I would estimate about 20 feet from the cottage in the tree line, and it was a clear, distinct crack of a tree limb. I would estimate the tree limb to be about one inch or more. Again, I knew what this was, having experienced this many times, and so I tried to peer into the tree line to see if I could see anything. I heard nothing else and saw nothing. I didn't want to shine a flashlight because I knew this might end the activity for the night so I just went inside the cottage. We all went to bed shortly afterwards. At 3.30 in the morning, I looked at the time immediately. Something hit or threw something at the cottage very, very hard. It shook the entire cottage and woke all of us up. Keep in mind that this is a fairly large cottage that is two stories tall with a basement walkout and sleeps all eight of us very well. I knew what was happening and got up to look around. I wanted to rule out any of the kids or dogs possibly walking around and maybe knocked something off of a shelf in the dark. So I walked all around the house from top to bottom. Everybody, including the dogs, were in their beds. The dogs never moved from their spots, even though I know they heard and felt the bang. I looked outside and saw nothing in the pitch black darkness. So I just went back to bed I lay there awake and listened for any other activity. Then, about a half hour later, I could hear something mumbling or grumbling outside the open window. That's the best way I know how to describe it. It was close to my window, but I still could not see anything when I looked out. I did not want to shine a light, hoping for more activity. At 4.15 in the morning, something gave a long, hard, scrape sound along the outside of the cottage. Then, nothing. In the morning at 6.30 a.m., I woke up and checked the outside perimeter of the cottage and the surrounding area. The ground is hard all around the cottage, so I found no imprints. I went inside the tree line, but still could not find no definitive prints. I could see no handprints or signs of damage on the outside walls. I could not find the tree break. I could not see any rocks or sticks lying close to the cottage that could have been thrown. I also found no physical signs of the scrape either. The next night, Tuesday, July 28th, while sitting by our bonfire again, we heard the same screams and howl from across the lake. This would occur off and on until about five in the morning. There was no more activity of any kind on Wednesday or Thursday, but I heard these screams and howls again on Friday, July 31st, during the night. And there were eight witnesses of us in total, either sitting by the campfire and in the cottage. The chances of somebody being out here and trying to play a trick on us is pretty minimal. The area itself is heavily forested on all sides for hundreds and hundreds of miles. 
This is all Canadian shield type landscape around the water's edge. It is a very hilly region in the Madawaska Valley with tall, visible rock cliffs and even some swamps. Wildlife is abundant, such as bear, wolves, coyotes, deer, moose, beaver, and other small game, and plenty of fish. First backpacking campsite on the Western Uplands Backpacking Trail, Rain Lake, Algonquin Provincial Park, Ontario, Canada. I was lying in my tent, about to fall asleep, when the forest around me went dead quiet. It was an uneasy feeling. Then I felt an enormous thud on the ground. The thud was totally silent and did not disturb my sleeping son. I thought that the thud was my heart giving out as it was followed by arrhythmia, and I was praying that this was not the time or the place for me to have a heart attack. I then thought I smelt a skunk smell, but when I breathed in deeper, a second breath, I smelt nothing. The forest remained calm, and I listened intently, thinking we were visited by a bear. The next morning, my son and I did some testing, as it is possible to feel vibrations from walking on the thin soil overlaying the shield rock, which sounds like hollow ground when walking upon it. We determined that whatever it was had to have been within four feet of the tent. We could not reproduce the amplitude of the thud. We did, however, discover where the animal came down from the trail into the campsite and determined that neither of us had walked that way that night. We also believed that a 400 pound bear could not have produced a thud unless it jumped. I thought that it felt more like a thousand pound moose but could not explain why a moose would come that close to a designated campsite. I also thought I heard a loon hooting later that night, but the hoot did not just sound right, as it was more of a whoop than a hoot, and much, much louder. There was a tree, about eight inches in diameter, that had been snapped off at about two feet above the ground, and was there when we arrived in camp. The splinters were fresh on the ground and not covered by other forest debris, such as pine needles and nearby ground conditions. The tree had been snapped off. I noticed this as I cut the splinted end off the stump for firewood in the morning. It had not been chopped down or cut down. It was just a stump. I did not think anything of it at the time. A dead tree blown down in the woods but in retrospect, it was fresh. No debris on the stump, which begs the question, where was the fallen tree? Surely somebody could have burned it up all that day. There was not enough fresh ash in the fire pit when we arrived. And also, who cuts up a fallen tree and hauls the whole thing off for firewood? I'm not even so sure that the tree was in that condition when I first surveyed the site after having went forward to survey the second site and return the first. I didn't notice until after my son and I were both off site for some time, hanging in the bear bags. Finally, earlier that night while preparing for bed, I asked my son several times, what? Thinking he was talking to me, but not understanding him. But he said that he said nothing. Listen, I've been in bear country before and had to chase one off before, but there when my son was seven, not 12, which is now, and took my daughter, who's 16 months old, last week. But I can honestly say that this was the most scared that I have ever been. If it was a Sasquatch or whatever they are called, I think I know why they are unhappy with our presence. I tested a bear banger flare at the bridge just to make sure there was one in working order. The wind caught the flare and blew it into a tree. Stupid me. It was embarrassing, having to tell my son to wait on the trail while I investigated to make sure my idiot moment didn't catch the forest on fire. How careless of me. Anybody having observed this stunt would have judged me for a rookie and wouldn't want me camping near them. And well, I am when it comes to backpacking. I have done wilderness canoe camping in areas like this dozens of times through. The place was littered with moose and bear sign, 
with many bare footprints that seemed large and elongated, more so than what I am used to seeing. Everything was not adding up, and decided to hike out, giving up on the last seven days of our adventure. While walking out, I had the feeling of being watched, and even noticed something large in the bushes about 40 meters away. Upon investigating and finding nothing, I just assumed it was an overactive imagination. But the more I think, the more things begin to add up in my mind. I have no problems with posting this incident. It is what happened. Spring of 2014, South Boone Country, Missouri. Driving down River Road, about 100 yards south of Cooper's Landing, along the Missouri River. We were heading out early to turkey hunt in Hartsburg Conservation Area. It was roughly 6.30 a.m., just getting light. I was driving with my brother-in-law, sitting beside me. About 30 yards in front of us, a large being jumped out of the Missouri River onto the road. It was black and wet. My headlights reflected off of the fur. It jumped onto the road and jumped up again to the bluff. It was about eight feet tall by the trees that were there by the river. We stopped and looked up the bluff to see or hear it moving, but nothing happened. The river level was high. I don't know what could swim in the torrents and driftwood rushing in. I had never seen a wild animal like it. It moved very animated and it sprang off of the road up the bluff. I will never forget what I saw. My husband and I rented a cabin in Nashville. We just came down for a year to Indiana. About 11 p.m., we went off to bed. Within minutes, our dogs went nuts. My husband got up to check and opened the front door of the cabin. It is covered by a porch and it was raining very, very hard. The porch light doesn't work, so it was dark. He closed the door and told me to bring a flashlight and firearm. I ran out of bed and went to him by the door. He said something was breathing heavy on the porch to the left of the door. At this point, it occurred to me that our dogs were strangely silent. Being Akitas that have seen bear, wolf, coyote, and lynx all up close in Alaska, this was not exactly normal. My husband slowly opened the door again, I being sure enough that something was breathing very heavy just to the side of the door. It also had an odor. It was really strong, musky, mixed with soggy old carpet and wet dog. We closed the door again while we chambered around and I lit the flashlight and we did a tactical to the left where we had heard the sound. It was gone but wet footprints that looked like they were made with soggy, fuzzy bedroom slippers were across the floor. It had come across our front lawn and up the right side of the porch and across the door to the other side, right where we had heard it. The prints were close together while passing the first window and the door, and when it fled, it did it on one step. The footprints were a lot larger than my foot in slippers, which is a woman's 9.5 wide. I wondered if it realized what chambering around meant, since we had opened the door twice, and it stayed breathing heavy, right on the other side. Right to the side where we could not see it. Dogs didn't scare it, and us two talking did not scare it. That would indicate it had human interaction maybe with hunters before. Not uncommon with bears in Alaska. A lot of people will chamber around, not wanting to hurt it, but ready to if it becomes aggressive. They are smart and learn very fast what that sound is. Another strange thing is that the dogs paced around all night. They did not do this after confronting an 800 pound brown bear in Alaska, literally. 
They worked together and chased all of the above away from around the home. We lived in a cabin off the grid. Not sure if we have a stinky homeless person wearing bedroom slippers living in the woods, but it is a very strange occurrence, and my husband was career ranger, not one to let his imagination run wild. We were stumped. The dogs, two of them, pooped in the cabin, something dogs are known to do when frightened, and these dogs are well housebroken. While bow hunting in a field in Kansas, I observed something that I can only describe as a Sasquatch. I was sitting on a stool next to a round bale of hay near the tree line. I was near a deer scrape. As I sat watching the tree line to no avail, it began to get too dark to see my fiber optic pins on my bow. So, I began gathering my gear to make my move to my vehicle. My friend was hunting further up the tree line in the timber. After gathering my belongings there, it was still light enough to see an opening near a corn patch. As I stood up, I saw a figure, which I thought at the time was my hunting buddy. I said in a normal voice, Did you see anything? The figure did not reply. Upon further observation, I saw that it was walking in my general direction. It stopped next to a round bale, and I realized that the figure was at least four foot taller than the bale of hay. I began moving toward the tree line, as to not silhouette myself. As the figure was closing the distance to 100 to 125 yards, I began to clearly make out body features. The head was kind of high with no visual neck, broad shoulders, which tapered down to a slim looking torso. The outline of the body allowed me to see that his arms, shoulders, legs were extremely muscular, like that of a professional athlete. The arms were longer than normal and he walked in silence. As I stood there, trying to figure out who or what I was seeing, I never had a sense of fear I had my iPhone on me, but it never dawned on me to make video, because I was in what felt like a dream, or shock. As I realized what I may be seeing, I hastily skirted the tree line to my truck. As I approached my truck, the first thing I did was open my palm and slap the hell out of my tailgate. As I hit my truck's tailgate, I then observed the figure drop down on all fours and in four seconds flat, it was gone. It either used the bales as cover, or it was the fastest living thing I have ever seen move. After meeting with my buddy, he informed me that he shot an arrow at a buck, but it ricocheted off the breastplate. He then informed me that the deer was going to run in my general direction toward the field, but the buck stopped in his tracks and looked into the field then turned around and came running back the same direction that my buddy just shot at him from. My girlfriend and I both had Friday off, May 15th, 2020, and decided to go to one of our favorite hikes up to Silver Star Mountain in Skamania County, Washington. We live in Portland, Oregon, and go up to that hike at least once or twice a year. We regard it as one of our favorite hikes in the area due to its close proximity to home and of course its sheer beauty. I was born in rural southwest Missouri and then spent my formative years growing up in Colorado. I'm an avid outdoorsman and spend a large amount of time backpacking, hiking, camping, snowboarding, and surfing in the wilderness, as well as my girlfriend. I went to school and work for environmental science and have years of experience collecting data in nature, including but not limited to animal tracking and navigation. We left around noon and arrived at the trailhead and began our hike 
right around 1 p.m. The hike is roughly 6.8 miles round trip and can be challenging on the way up due to the 2,000 feet elevation gain to the top of Silver Star Mountain. The trailhead was filled with cars, although most of the foot traffic we encountered was on the way up as others were heading down. We like to hike in the afternoon for this very reason. We are both very active and fit and didn't stop on the way up, except for once when nature called. Near the top, we encountered some snow, as expected, but not nearly as much as the year prior. We finished the hike and were at the top of Silver Star Mountain. It was overcast with patches of sunlight, but no wind or rain and was generally pleasant. During that time, we were alone on the craggy peak and only a handful of other people were on the ridge to the south. The mountain is surrounded by valleys, carving through the landscape on all sides. My girlfriend is in the medical field and was on call that day. She was digging through her backpack for her work phone just to check her voicemails since we had very limited service. I was rummaging through my pack for snacks. It was during this time that I heard the first series of very strange noises from the closest valley to the north. It was a very distinct and loud whoop whoop. The first whoop segment of noises was deep, and the second part having an extreme pitch change that I could not correlate to any known animal that I've ever heard. I asked my girlfriend if she heard it, but she was preoccupied with her phone. It was around this time that a couple of other hikers showed up with their dog. We wanted to set out on the rocks overlooking the views. So, we moved slightly further down the ridge from them to a rock outcrop and ate some snacks and took pictures. In between conversation, the noise happened again from the same spot in the valley to the north. It was about 15 minutes from the first one. It was loud and filled the entire valley giving me the feeling that it was a rather large animal. My girlfriend heard it this time, and we both looked at each other, very puzzled to say the least. The other hikers behind us were carrying on conversation and didn't seem to be paying attention to the noise, but their dog had kept going to the ridge and looking to the direction of the noise. We waited there in silence to hear it again but unfortunately never did. We decided to head back down the trail. About halfway back down, the trail passes beneath Pyramid Rock. We had always wanted to scramble this rock to see the views and felt energized that day to do so. Pyramid Rock is comprised of loose rock and can be very dangerous to climb. We picked our line going up the north side, which was rather steep and came to a shallow cave towards the top. It was probably 20 feet wide and 20 feet high, but maybe only 10 feet deep. There were remnants of a campfire here, as well as a four foot wall or blind made of stacked rock around the entrance. After making it to the top, we decided we were hungry, so we hightailed it back home. Upon returning home, I checked the BFRO for reports of anywhere around the area, and I found some interesting ones that described the exact area we were in. I would also like to add that the first few seconds of the Barry Moorhead Whoops and Knocks audio here on BFRO are nearly identical to what we had heard that day. This happened back in 1997, in June in Washington County, Oregon. I rode my horse through this area on many occasions. It was roughly two years earlier, and it was still as fresh in my memory as yesterday. On this summer day, my friend and I had just crossed a creek and were riding to the bottom of a ridge. It is a game trail. I was the lead ride, and my German Shepherd was on my heels, with my friend being behind me. In the distance, 
approximately 120 yards, I saw first what I thought was a bear, foraging. It saw me and took off on two feet, straight up this ridge. My dog ran after it, and she was gone for a half an hour. I could not ride my horse where I believe what I saw was a Sasquatch. I took another game trail and galloped to the top and into a wheat field. I called and called for my dog, and she did return eventually, pretty tired. My friend never saw a thing. This event happened so fast, in a blink of an eye. It was dark blackish, and I have to believe it was young. Not broad, just stocky. I was just 16 years old. My brother's best friend had been over earlier that day. He needed a ride home, and so I asked my parents if I could take him home. They said yes, so the three of us got into my dad's 1980 Ford Ranger F-150, which was four-wheel drive and seemed somewhat lifted. I would say the truck stood an easy six foot tall. So, my brother's friend lived about two to three miles from us, but off a dirt gravel road. It was a clear night, and it was pretty dark out at this time, since, after all, this was December. As I rounded the final turn to his house, my lights caught something in front of us. This bipedal being stood, an easy seven foot tall, was covered in light brown fur and jumped into the ditch on a single leg, jumped the fence to keep the cattle in. This was impossible for any person to do. I couldn't believe what I just saw. My brother's friend leaned over and said, did you just see that? So, all three of us seen Bigfoot that night, many, many years ago. Hiking the Seven Sisters Trail from Mount Holyoke to the notch in the Hadley Amherst area of Massachusetts. My hiking partner and I got to Taylor's Notch and can hear the wind ripping through, making eerie noises. We both heard a lot of whistling and breaking branches, which I just initially attributed to the wind going through the rocky ledges of Taylor's Notch. We hiked over one large hill and the wind was lessening, but we realized the whistling was closer and there were whooping noises and calls along with the whistles. The calls were going back and forth and that's when I realized we were surrounded. We kept talking loudly, hoping to scare off any animals and I kept my bear spray in hand for the next mile. Not sure what it was, but highly unusual and did not sound like a grown or baby bear, canine, coyote, mountain lion, or fox. I frequently hike and spend a lot of my time outdoors. I am at a loss as to what to say or what it was with us. I'm going to go back soon to see if I can find out more. I had some strange experiences in my childhood. A friend from up the street. She and I would walk through the woods together. There was a path that went in a big circle where the older neighborhood kids would ride dirt bikes. It was about a mile around, I'd say. When we'd get about two thirds of the way around this circle, we'd hear single short whistles and small stones that would be tossed near us. We thought it was the neighborhood kids, so kind of ignored it. But this would happen every time we walked around in that section of woods. About three-fourths of the way around the circle, we saw some matted down dry grass that looked a lot like a bedding area. Also, some strange footprints as well in the muddy areas. They were huge footprints and the toes seemed almost rectangular in the dried footprints. We'd also smell a wet dog type smell in this area. The last time I was in that section of woods was probably around 1975 to 1976. A couple of other times, 
I'd go with a friend to the Howell, Farmingdale area. We'd walk back to an abandoned house in the woods and drink a few beers. We'd hear noises and saw some of the same sized footprints that the neighbor and I had seen in the woods directly behind my neighborhood. Fast forward five years or so, a boyfriend and I were smoking cigarettes in the school field by the house that I grew up in. It was fall, just at dusk, probably 6 p.m. ish. I happened to look up and look across the school field and saw this huge shadow standing on a slightly raised hill across the school field by another neighborhood. I stared at that figure for a minute thinking that person sure has long arms. It was probably 60 feet away from us at the time. I stared a minute more, and suddenly, I could see that figure crystal clear as it bolted across the school field towards us. As it got closer, I could see reddish-brown shaggy fur on this huge man-ape type creature. It ran towards us silently, but with huge strides, as it came closer and closer, all I could do was yell run, and we ran through a neighbor's yard and back to my house. I told my mother what happened, and she said we shouldn't have been in the school field when it was getting dark. I was petrified, and the next day, my boyfriend and one of his friends went back to look for this thing, but we never found it again. I very recently talked to my son about this incident and even wrote it out for him, as I wanted my story documented. I still, to this very day, get goosebumps every time I talk about it. This happened just this year, around Nine Mile Falls, Washington. What I heard, at approximately 2.15 a.m., my Labrador Retriever began barking at something outside, this is not unusual, as we live on a closed golf course which is adjacent to Riverside State Park, and we often have varying types of nature near our home. After letting the dog out to relieve himself, I returned to bed. Outside temp was approximately 60 degrees, and we had the bedroom windows open. Our bedroom faces the closed golf course. What I heard next was a very loud howl. At first, I thought it was a police car or an ambulance traveling on Highway 291 that had turned on its siren, but then the sound simply went from soft to loud to suddenly stopping, so it was not a siren. I listened intently to try and figure out what was going on, and about two minutes later, I heard a similar but more faint siren sound. This was not a coyote, nor a wolf, or was it the sound of a neighbor's dog. It was different, and as I said, it sounded like a siren with only one long continuous woo. I noted the time, 2.20 a.m. exactly. It sounded like it could have been a few blocks away. I have been checking local websites and Facebook groups to see if anybody else has heard it, but so far nothing. I can't be the only one to have heard this. Perhaps a person who's making the noise is a part of Bigfoot hunting, maybe. The other thing I'd like to add is that we feed birds and squirrels in our yard. Approximately six weeks prior, we had our squirrel feeder torn off the tree at night. We heard a crashing outside and could not identify anything that particular night. But the following morning, however, we discovered the feeder's lid which is screwed on into the top on a very heavy hinge, was ripped off completely. We jokingly said maybe we should look for Bigfoot prints or hair in the area. Anyway, the howl was definitely something not of the ordinary. We were on a drive from our home, eight miles east of Sheldon, Missouri, to our grandsons in Wheatland, Missouri. We bought our other grandson a new used car and was learning to drive it. This was his first long drive, about 45 minutes. It rained on and off, fairly heavy, 
and he was white-knuckling it. His grandpa sat shotgun, and I crammed my butt in the fancy deep bucket seat in back. I stared out the window to keep myself from backseat driving, letting John deal with Haven's sketchy handling of the cougar, a sleek black two-door. We were coming up on another stand of thick forest when I saw your typical Bigfoot running in the woods parallel to our vehicle. I wanted to scream, Look, it's Bigfoot! But I knew we'd end up upside down in the highway ditch, probably dead. I then thought of getting John's attention, but being your typical old man, he'd blow it, and we'd end up upside down in the ditch. I wanted somebody else to see it, but every scenario left us dead in a ditch, so I clammed up and stared. It was at least doing our speed, about 40 miles an hour. Then, the massive dark figure turned into the woods deeper, and I lost it. It ran just like a man, was very thick and covered in hair, much too large to be a human, running in an agile, fast-moving fashion. This was in fall rain in 2016. In February of 2011, I was traveling down Highway 95 between an area of Idaho around midnight to two in the morning. It was thickly wooded pasture off to the right side of the highway, an open grass pasture and creek on the left. I was driving into a curve around a private road area when approximately 50 feet in front of me, I saw a very large dark form walk straight across the highway right to left. I assumed it was a human, so I slowed to a full stop in the middle of a highway, which was empty, both directions, except for me. It was at this point that I realized that I could not see this person off the side of the highway or out in the grass pasture to my left. I had my high beams on, and the area was very well lit from that. I developed an awful sense of dread and immediately hit the gas and headed for home, which was around five to six miles away. I was so bothered by this event that I continually checked my rearview mirror, fully expecting to see something horrible or have something horrible happen to me. Once I got home, I bolted into the house, turned on all the lights, and woke my family up. They kind of laughed it off, but my dog had crawled up into my lap and whined and cried at me and would not leave my side. I definitely did not sleep that night and started avoiding driving that highway so late at night. It wasn't until later that I really started to process the details of what happened. I realized that I saw someone, very distinctly bipedal, walk across the highway. I remember the walking motion of the legs and the slight swinging motion of the arms. I also realized that while I had my high beams on the figure, it was completely black. No reflection from clothes, shoes, or even a shadow thrown onto the highway. The other thing that very much bothered me was that I never took my eyes off of what happened, but somewhere between the figure walking across the highway and walking off the side, it disappeared. I definitely should have been able to see something walking down the side of the ditch or into the pasture, but it was completely empty. It took me quite some time to come to terms with what happened, and even longer before I admitted to myself that it may indeed have been a Sasquatch-related sighting. I've recently been compelled to report this specific sighting due to the fact that very recently, a woman has claimed to have seen a Sasquatch right before hitting a deer in almost the exact same area and a similar time frame. But she's been made into a joke in the local news. I don't know if she actually saw a Sasquatch, but I find it a very, very odd coincidence that it happened in that area of the highway in the same time frame. I was getting ready for bed one night at our upper house here on Black Mountain in North Carolina. There was no development at this time, 
so the woods behind the house would still be considered wilderness. We had a cat that was not supposed to be in the house, so when he ran inside and hid under our bunk beds, I had to go and get him. I bent down to pick him up from under the bed, and as I stood back up, I looked out the window that was right in front of me. As I looked out at the starry sky, I was shocked, if not terrified, to see the dark outline of a strange figure walking past the window. Because of the treetops, I could only see the top half of the body, but I would estimate it to be at least seven feet tall. It looked very large and lofty. I knew it couldn't be anybody that was on the mountain at the time. The shape of the head was that of a man with a mullet, so you couldn't make out the contour of the back of the head. It sort of went straight down. One thing I remember thinking was strange about the way it walked. It swung its arms as it walked, kind of like pendulums. The time was dusk, and the weather was pretty clear, and there were no clouds in the sky because I could see the stars very easily. The moon was also giving off more light than usual, so it was a great backdrop for a silhouette. I had a pretty good sighting of this thing. In the fall of 1986, I was driving up a lone mountain road in North Carolina. The road turned to dirt and gravel about halfway up. About 35 to 40 feet after, it dropped off the pavement. I noticed something standing beside a big tree. At first, I thought it was a bear, maybe scratching itself on the tree. But as I got closer, it did not run off. I've drove up on bears before, and they always ran off. Except this animal didn't run. It just kind of watched me go by. It was about dusk, dark. I couldn't really make it out that well. But I can tell you that it stood on two legs, and it was upright like a man. It had long darkish hair hanging from its arms and legs. Its head came to kind of a point at the very top. If I had to guess, I'd say it stood between six and a half to seven and a half feet tall and weighed roughly 500 pounds. It turned its head kind of watching me drive by. I hit my brakes but was already past it, so it went on quickly to the end of the road and turned around. I drove back down the road and as I neared the tree, I slowed down and rolled down my window, determined to see what this was, but it was already gone. I could not bring myself to get out of the car and inspect the area. At least not then. I went back the next morning to look for tracks. As I went up the road, I saw people coming down. I saw one of my friends. He was waving me to stop from his open window. I stopped and asked what was going on. He said the road was blocked. The big tree in the bend had fallen across the road. I didn't know at the time till I got up there that it was the exact tree that that thing was standing beside. There were some folks chainsaws cutting in the tree out in the road, and doing so, obliterating any tracks that may have been there. It was dark, and we noticed we were running low on firewood. This was back in October in 2001. We walked down a trail on the south side of the campsite to get some wood from a small clearing that we had noticed earlier. We were watching some lights move across Brown Mountain, trying to determine if they were the Brown Mountain lights. Apparently, this is a locally known phenomenon, or just motorcycles. At any rate, it was about this time we heard the noise. We had our flashlights off because we were watching the lights on Brown Mountain. Then, we heard this long scream. We stopped in our tracks and listened very carefully. The scream repeated. It was coming from the southwest of our location, deep in the valley. We hurried back up to camp and turned off the radio in the truck. The screaming continued. Now, this has been going on for a couple of minutes, 
and the scream changed. It would scream for a few seconds, and then the sound would start to break up. At the time, we described it as a crackle-like sound, but the newspaper article that we found described it as a yodeling, which is probably more accurate. This continued on for several minutes. Every few seconds, another scream continuing on to the yodel. Both of us are avid campers and camp in the same area every October. But we had never heard a sound like this before. We first thought perhaps a mountain lion because we had heard their cries compared to a woman in pain screaming. We debated for a while and at last decided to move to another campsite for the night as we had not explored our surroundings much prior to nightfall. We have yet to be back, but we have full intentions on going back and exploring the valley from which the sound came. Leaving from Wilson Mills, North Carolina, I went to visit with my fiance and her family in Taylorsville, Hickory, North Carolina, on October 15th, 2012. On October 18th, 2013, around 5.45 p.m., I left to go meet her and her nephews to take them to a haunted trail for Halloween after she had gotten off work. I left from their mobile home and turned right onto Friendship Church Road in Taylorsville to get on the 16. It is about five miles from their home on Friendship Church Road to Highway 16. About 30 seconds after I pulled out of the driveway onto the road, I looked into an open field on the left and they sell grapes. There is a dirt road that leads to the vineyard area and about 30 to 40 yards off the road and about 15 yards off of the dirt road was the time where I thought a bear was sitting on its butt. I only saw it for about four seconds while passing. I got down the road about one eighth of a mile and turned around in a local church parking lot. When I got back, there was yet another vehicle turned into the dirt path. I slowed down and rolled my windows down, and the lady asked me, Do you see that thing? Which I didn't see it anymore. She then pointed. I looked, and it was walking on two legs into the tree line. We then spoke for a few more minutes before I left. I told her I turned around to get another look. I knew that it was not a bear after I saw it walking on two legs, just like a man. While on vacation, my family and I were camping at Linville Trailer Lodge and Campground in Linville, North Carolina. On June 15th, 2010, we were all sleeping in our pop-up camper. At two in the morning, I was woken up by the sound of an animal to the southeast of our camper. Its calls were four short whoops, followed by one double whoop. After listening to that for a couple of minutes, I heard another one calling from the northwest. Its call was three short whoops, followed by a double whoop. While listening to that one, another one from the northwest started calling. Its calls were two short whoops, followed by a double whoop. After a couple of minutes, I could hear them calling and moving towards the northeast. It sounded like they were within 100 yards of our camper but I was the only one that got woken up. On June 17th, we got ready for bed at around 9 p.m. And around 9.30 p.m., I could hear the same calls as the second and third animals from the two nights prior. They were much farther away this time. My eight-year-old daughter heard them and also asked what kind of animal makes that sound. I did not answer her. After we got home, I got onto the website and played the whoops and knocks from the Sierra Nevada mountains. My daughter came running from her bedroom and said that is what I heard the other day. Then I explained to her what it is she heard. In 1977 to 1978, I lived in Sandwich, Massachusetts. We were the last house in the neighborhood I was living in. Behind us was the woods that ran for an entire mile or more in each direction. 
One snowy Saturday in December, I was home alone, watching TV. My parents worked frequently, and even though I was only around 12 years old at the time, I was home alone, a lot. I was watching TV in our den, which was situated between two windows. It was around noon and overcast. My dog frequently barked whenever a car drove up. When she started barking this time, I turned my head down our hallway to yell at her to shut up. Looking back to the TV, I was startled to see a face peering through my window. To the best of my memory, the face was furry. Whatever it was was only around five to six feet tall. I screamed, and it made some kind of grunting noise. It immediately took off around the back of the house, running on two legs, and through an open breezeway to the front and into the woods. To say I was frightened was an understatement. I immediately called some friends who came over to calm me down. After thinking about it for a while, I thought it could have been one of my friends wearing a mask and playing a joke on me. That theory ended when we went outside to see what the creature's footprints looked like. We were shocked to see hoofed footprints. I never saw any sign of this creature again. But, after reading what the men and Moshpee saw two to three years prior, it sounded like Cape Cod might have a Bigfoot of some kind. I have been a believer that Bigfoot exists for years just based on how many people have reported seeing or hearing something over hundreds and hundreds of years. I am 64 years old and have been hiking and camping ever since I was about 12 years old, and I have seen and heard many things in the woods. On February 27th, 2016, my friend Dean and I set out for an overnight camping trip in Mount Washington State Forest in Mass. I always record our adventures on video, but this time, I decided to run an MP3 recorder all night and get the sounds of the night. I did get what I think was a bobcat walking up to my tent, but around two in the morning, I was awake again because it was very cold and hard to sleep. I was only half awake when I heard a very loud noise, but not awake enough to really tell what it was except that it was a good ways off. I knew I was recording audio, so I noted the time so I can find it on my recorder and went back to sleep. Or at least I tried to. When I got home, I found the sound on my MP3 recorder, and it sounds a lot like a wood knock. But judging by the amount of echo, and how loud it was from so far away, it had to be something very big that made that noise. I do not think that even Babe Ruth could swing a bat fast and hard enough to make that sound. First, some details on the location. After 9-11, the government closed the throughway that runs alongside the reservoir that feeds Springfield its water supply. These mountains have been off limits to hunters, hikers, fishermen, and the public for years previous to 9-11. Now it's completely blocked off. Lots of deer and wildlife in this large expanse of protected mountainous terrain. The reservoir holds lots of smallmouth bass, rainbow trout, brook, and brown trout. My uncle worked at the pumping station. He let me and my cousin fish there. I stayed there for weeks at a time and as an adult, I couldn't help myself to go fishing there still. I respected the land and put all fish back and wouldn't throw any trash around. I packed it up and brought it back with me. I fished there all day sometimes, but mostly at night with topwater poppers for smallmouth bass. I parked up the road a ways so any cops or ranger patrol cars didn't see my car. It was about 1 a.m., with three quarters of the moon showing. The water was very low this day. I was fishing, and there was about four beaver tail slaps on the water, 
I was trying to get a fish off the hook that I had caught when I heard something very heavy about 45 yards away from me, cracking sticks as it approached me from the road onto the freshly cut brush from the work they did around there days prior. It sounded like a human walking and I thought I was in trouble with the law. My flashlight was dying and I was having trouble seeing just getting the fish off my two treble hooks. I asked, who's there? And I just heard a stick snap, really loud, as it stood still. I hit my flashlight in order to make it brighter, and I seen big eye shine and a dark silhouette of what looked to be shoulders. I started yelling at it to get out of here, and at this point, I'm thinking deer, or worse, maybe a bear standing up. I heard a few more big snaps as it walked onto the paved road, and that's when it cried out, in this terrible noise that I've never heard before. It echoed through the mountains, and it scared the bejesus out of me. It was not a bear, or a deer, that's for sure. It was huge, and the sound of it made it sounded like a shrieking demon baby. That's the only way I could describe it. A loud shrieking howl. It wasn't a roar or a deep growl. It was much more high-pitched. I cut my line with a lure, still in the fish's mouth, and kicked the fish haphazardly into the water and ran as fast as I could to my car, which was the scariest run, walk, stop, and listen journey to my car that I've ever had in my life. I was waiting for a werewolf to jump out and get me, or something. True terror like that I've never experienced to this day. In November of 1996, just a couple of days before Thanksgiving, my best friend and I were camping and deer hunting in a forestry land in southeastern Oklahoma. The nearest town would be Smithville, but even at that, it would be somewhere nine miles as the crow flies. Land has since been sold to John Hancock Corporation this area is in the same general area as where my written report occurred. This area is used to grow soft pine trees for harvesting to grind into paper pulp. The total area is something around 800,000 acres. So, you can imagine how big of an area this is. There are no homes or anybody living at all. In fact, you are not even allowed to build any permanent hunting cabins or such. By this time of 1996, I had actually all but given up gun deer season. I was almost strictly a bow hunter. About three years before, I was actually in a tree stand and had a bullet go over my head. Some idiot was out there somewhere. Never seen him, but heard the shot, but never seen the guy that pulled the trigger. Anyway, he was out there just taking pot shots. I had decided after that, I would just stay with my bow hunting. However, my buddy wanted me to go with him as he was alone. So, I decided to go ahead and accompany him. The area that we camped is in an area that is very difficult to get to, and rarely does anybody go into this area. You have to exit off a logging road and travel up this very steep clear cut that climbs up a small mountain. This is really not even a road as such that you have to travel along. At one time, the loggers just took a dozer and cut a path the width of the dozer from the bottom of the mountain all the way up and then along the crest of the mountaintop. And this path is never maintained, so it gets very rough and only a 4x4 four four can get through. And even with that, you have to drive at a speed little more than walking. This path travels about three miles, and simply dead ends, just at the start of the downward side of the mountain. Me and my buddy call it the dish. We call it that because you are traveling up this mountain in heavy forest, make a curve, then suddenly you are facing down, and at the bottom is an area that very much resembles a satellite dish where it is void of trees, and the concave shape of the ground gives the impression 
of a satellite dish. This clear area is roughly 30 feet or so in diameter. So, we make the journey up the mountain and take the treacherous path up to the dish. There, we make our camp, and it of course becomes our home away from home for the next few days. It was a bit odd. Normally, you see one or two hunting camps once you enter the area from the highway. But this time, we see not one camper hunter. Now to take note, the dish from the highway is roughly 14 miles. Now of course, that is not straight line miles, because you know how access and logging roads rarely ever run straight for any distance. On day three of our hunting trip, we get up before daylight, as usual, and get ready to go out into nature and see if we can find any deer. After all, that was why we were there. Even so, I had seen nothing the previous two days, but didn't really care because, as usual, I was very much enjoying myself with the flora and fauna. I'm also very interested in geology, and there is much to see in that area. To imagine that area at one time was a shallow sea never ceases to amaze me. I wish when I first took my geology course in college, I would have changed my major and pursued that field further. Oh, sorry there, got off track. We decided that which directions we were going to go, and we planned for our rendezvous back at the dish for 12 noon. We walked together for about half a mile, camp, and there we split up. My buddy continues to the west, along the top of the mountain, and I head south down the side of the mountain. Being that it was not yet daylight, these woods are very thick and dangerous to walk in during the daylight hours due to the rough, rocky terrain. I was not about to do any walking until first light. So, after we split, I only walked for about 10 yards or so and sat down and waited for a few more minutes until the sun decided to come up. At sun up, I get up and start my hunt. I normally am not a stalker for a couple of reasons. To be a successful stalker, you must have proper coordination to walk and not make noise. Also, you really need a lot of stamina. I possess neither of those traits, so I normally hunt from some type of stand. But I had sat for several hours the evening before and was ready to move. Plus, I wanted to do some exploring into a saddle that I had never been into before. So this day, I decided to stalk. Here's an important note. I am using the term saddle here and will continue using that term. However, it really is not a saddle as such. A saddle is the gap between two mountains where they run close together. This area is on the same mountain, but it has two ridges or fingers extending out away from the mountain, making a gap and valley in between these two parallel fingers, much like a saddle. Imagine, if you will, make a fist with your left hand. Then, after you make a fist, extend your index and middle finger out like you are making the peace sign. Your hand is the mountain, and your two extended fingers are these fingers that extend out from the mountain. The width of this finger is, I'm guessing, somewhere around 150 yards, but could not see all the way through because of the trees. I will be walking down the eastern finger, which in the above example would be your middle. Your index will be the western finger, or ridge. I hate using the term ridge because it's too vague. The distance between these two fingers were only roughly 50 yards apart of the mountain, and by the time you get out to the tips, they are nearly 100 yards apart. So, technically, they are not parallel, either do they diverge some, and the length of finger I am on is about 300 yards in length. Never went up there, so I have no clue how wide it is across. Also, the crest of that finger is about 20 to 30 yards higher than the one I am on. There's the end of that note. So, I start walking down the mountainside, 
and after about an hour and a half, I reach the eastern finger of the saddle. I start walking down the mountainside, and after about a half an hour, I reach the eastern finger of the saddle. I sit for a few minutes to rest and catch my breath before taking out down this finger of the saddle. On this finger, I could view the saddle valley to my right and also could see the eastern side of the western finger on the saddle. From the top of the finger, I was walking. I could see very clearly down to the bottom of the saddle, which again, was no more than 100 feet to the floor to the nearest mountain. And as you walked the top of the finger away from the mountain, this finger sloped downward toward the valley so that by the time the finger ended, the valley within the saddle was no more than 50 feet from the peak of the finger. So, from my 12 o'clock position to 180 degrees to my right, clockwise, I had a totally unobstructed view, with the exception of the trees in the saddle's valley. But I had a clear enough view that if a deer was in there or came through that valley, there was no way I would miss seeing it. This particular course gave me a good look at the western finger face, although with many trees on it, there were several spots that had no trees, and the rocks were exposed, which would give me a chance to look to see if I could distinguish the types of rocks over there. I could also watch the ridge top of the western finger and see anything coming over the top. Over to my right, across the top of this finger, is heavily wooded with mainly hardwoods. However, there were some pine trees among them. This is old growth trees from hardwood, like oaks and hickory, and are quite large. It is heavily wooded enough that even in the bright sun, it is fairly dark, and they're only a few feet in. Not dark enough that you can't see, but you certainly would not need sunglasses in there. It, just like up in the dish, gets dark in there, long before the sun is fully set. There is very little undergrowth in this area because it is so sunlight challenged and the spacing between trees are fairly wide so that if anything of any size moved through, you would have no trouble sighting it. This tree line extends almost all the way to the edge of this finger. You would have maybe five feet of space to walk the length of the finger clear of trees. From the edge of this finger, I am on in some places are straight down into the valley. The only way to get on this finger is from the direction I came, or, as I will speak to later, would be from the very end of the tip. So, I slowly stalk down this finger, keeping just inside the tree line, as to not be exposed to the valley floor and the western finger. I stalk very slowly along in no hurry whatsoever. Understanding that stalking means walk a few steps, stop, wait, listen, and repeat. I stalk nearly the entire length of this finger and decide I needed a break, so I walk out of the tree line to a spot that is actually clear of trees. There was a very fine looking stump there that actually looked like it was made for my butt and it was high enough that I did not have to bend my knees very far. I figured I would sit there for a while and rest my legs. Then, I would finish walking all the way. Then, head back because we were to hook back up at noon. And by now, it was roughly 9.30. And I was a good three miles from camp and had a very hard climb back up the mountain. As I was sitting on my stump, I looked down the finger out to the tip. At the tip was a huge oak tree. I'm five foot ten, and it would have took two of me to wrap my arms around this giant tree. As I was looking at this tree and trying to figure out how a tree can grow to that size in such little soil, I then notice, just off to the right of this tree, a figure walking up below the tip of the finger. The figure was bright in sunlight, so I immediately recognized it as walking on two feet and he appeared to me to be walking with his head down. But my first thought was, what an idiot. It is deer season, and if you are in hunting, you are required to wear blaze orange, and this guy had none. 
even if you are not hunting. It is a good idea if you're out in the woods. Now, granted, I had only seen one human in three days, and that was my hunting partner. And even though there were no humans for miles, I, for one, would never take a stupid chance like that. I guess that I should also mention that during the deer gun season, logging operations cease and the loggers go home. The companies do not want their employees getting plugged by some knucklehead hunter. So I knew that this guy was not a logger. Then the next question came to my mind. How did this guy get there? There is no logging road in that direction for a very long way. And from the nearest road, it is a long haul to the point. And that haul would not be easy at all. In fact, that area is very inaccessible, even by an ATV. The next thought, no, he is not a hunter, nor is he carrying a rifle or have one slung on his shoulders. Now, remember all these thoughts were processed in my head in a matter of microseconds while this guy was walking slowly up this slope to the top of this finger that I'm on. Then, the next thought through my mind, gosh, that cone head from the movie with hair, because his head was very pointy. Next thought, my god, those are big shoulders. Then my next thought, why is he wearing a mink coat? My next thought, did God forget to give this guy a neck? It looked to me as his head was attached directly to his shoulders. Then, this guy finally reaches the top and stands directly beside that big oak I was looking at just moments ago. Next thought, that is one big mother effer. I have seen many football games, and some of those have been up in the nosebleed section, and those guys even that high up look big. But this was different. I am now 83 yards from this guy, and he is the biggest, largest person I have ever seen, bar to none. Then, the big guy looks up and looks directly at me, out in front. It was then I realized, okay, I'm not looking at any man, but not really an animal either, it didn't seem. Now, let me attempt to explain what this big guy did. Imagine yourself standing, looking straight ahead at some target, and right next to you, and slightly in front of you to your right, is a big tree. Your desire now is to get behind that tree with little movement as possible. What you would most likely do is simply lift your left foot and pivot 90 degrees counterclockwise on your right foot, with your head and neck frozen in place to watch your target while moving. That is what he done. Next thought, do I have any clean underwear back at camp? Cause me thinks I need them. Then the fight or flight response kicked in, but I forced myself to stop and think and evaluate. It was then I determined that 83 yards, didn't know it was exactly 83 at the time. I went and marked off the distance later on. I was actually guessing at the time 100. There was no way, no matter how fast he was, that he could cover that much distance before I put at least three bullets in him. The big guy was now standing behind the oak, watching me. Then suddenly, he popped behind the tree, and I couldn't see him. So at that point, I slowly got up and moved behind that little tree near me. Then I peeked around the basketball-sized tree. And by the way, at that time, I was beach ball size, so you can see the tree really offered me no concealment to see what was happening. By the time I looked back up, he was once again peeking out from behind the tree. Now this time, I thought that poor guy is deformed somehow because there appeared to be some kind of growth just around and below his throat. I could not make it out, but definitely could see discoloration and could see that there was something there that did not belong. I was straining as hard as I could to make out the facial features of this guy, but I try as I might. There was simply no way I could make out any details of his face. My one real regret in this entire experience. Anyway, we just kind of stared at each other for a couple of seconds. Then, he popped back behind the tree, 
so I'd done the same thing the best I could. Here I am in an area with trees the size of Volkswagens and leave me to pick up a sapling to hide behind. After a couple of seconds behind a tree, I pop my head and don't see him, but I stay in that position a couple more seconds. Then the big guy pops out his head again and looks at me. Now, I'm really confused because the growth seemed to be on his throat is now over on the top where a clavicle would be. I don't know what is going on. It is just too far away to make out fine detail. Someone with better vision probably would have been able to make things out better. Now, here it becomes surreal, and I don't know if I can put into words the way the situation seemed to instantly change. One moment, I am so tense, you could not have driven a straight pin at my butt with a 16-pound sledgehammer. The very next second, a calming came over me, and somehow, I just had a feeling that there was nothing to be concerned about. So while he was looking at me, I purposely leaned my rifle up against the stump I was just sitting at with him watching me. I just got the distinct feeling that he knew that I meant no harm and had no intention of doing anything to him. Maybe not, maybe. I am just reading more into that than I should. For lack of a better word, we basically played peekaboo for another two minutes, popping back and forth. After a total of just about three minutes, he very suddenly snaps around the other direction. I was thinking, what on earth? Then, I heard what he heard a very large snap coming from the woods on top of his finger. Then the big guy turns, and keeping the tree between me and him, he simply just walks off. He did not run or even walk particularly fast. He was walking a bit faster than leaving than he did but not in any panic. I figured if it was something that made him want to leave the area, I had better figure out quick what made that noise. So I picked up my rifle and immediately began scanning. I want so badly to walk over to the tip to see if I can glimpse a big guy, but I don't care until I resolve this issue. After a few minutes of searching and listening to the noise, I finally tracked the source of the noise maker a friggin' tank rat. I missed a possible chance to get a better look at that guy because of a tank rat, which is my personal term for armadillo. As stated above, after the incident, I walked off the distance and also solved one of the mysteries. The abnormal growth on this guy was not on big guy at all. It was on the tree. It was a viral knot about the size of a softball. Standing under the knot, I could barely touch the bottom of it with my fingers, standing on my tiptoes and arms extended as far as I could. I found no tracks whatsoever, even though I knew the exact location of where he walked up and back from. But the ground was hard pan, and even a D9 bulldozer would have been hard pressed to leave any marks or tracks there.